Hello, and welcome this April 2nd, 2022. It is a Saturday, and welcome once again to another episode of Misfits of the Galaxy, my vlog series, where I try to put my thoughts and ideas together for a upcoming campaign setting I intend on running for my fellow podcast members of the Isle of Misfit Rolls. If you haven't heard of the Isle of Misfit Rolls before, we are a podcast group that uh, is now running into our second season at this point, uh, where we are heroes in the a world of our DM, Mike's creation. Uh, the world is called Vertess, and it is suffering from a corrupting darkness which our brave intrepid adventurers who are a motley crew of thieves thugs and murderers or at least they were they were supposed to be have been uh, sort of shanghaied into into sort of a indentured service where we are we are attempting to fight the good fight in a sort of high fantasy suicide squad so if you like that sort of description or if I'll put the link down below, and we'd really appreciate it if you start listening. Uh, I'm certain you'll enjoy it. Additionally, we are transitioning in Season 2 to a live for Twitch stream format every Tuesday about 9 p.m. Eastern Standard Time to about 11.30 Eastern Standard Time, um, where you'll be able to see this ugly mug in real time, react to events unfolding, as well as that of my fellow players. We'd love to have you. Put the links down below as well. So, jumping into it, uh, this is the Misfits of the Galaxy is a a mixing pot of Guardians of the Galaxy, Spelljammer, D and D. It's a high fantasy space opera, effectively, with lots of action. At least that's my plan, and I've been using a lot of the uh, dark matter uh, campaign. Uh, campaign information from Mage Hand Press, I'll put a link to them down below as well, to put this campaign together. Not, I like putting my own spin on things and doing my own sort of story or world, but I, I don't mind borrowing from things that I do love. So last week was our 13th episode, so this will be number 14, and I was discussing the various Op class options that were going to be available, which included the core rulebook, as well as the Artificer and the Blood Hunter. Additionally, I was permitting multi-class, and there were a bunch of other classes from um, Valdis' Secret of the Spire, I believe is what it's called, as well as the Dark Matter uh, rulebook that I was going to add to the campaign. Adam, the uh, player of Almus, our Gith Yankee wizard in our Isle of Misfit Rolls game, uh, mentioned that he was int intrigued about the Captain class, so I thought I'd put a bit more detail into it on this episode. And if I get done with that, I have the other content I was intending on discussing, which is like uh, graphs which are both monster and construct. Construct grass being the uh, equivalent of, of course, uh, cybernetics, and monster graphs being uh, what would happen if uh, if witchers from uh, certain Netflix and book series and video game series suddenly decided to go to a further extreme and actually start physically grafting monster parts of themselves. But uh, despite how grotesque and exciting that might sound, uh, let's just jump into the captain first and foremost. So the captain is a... It, the best description I can give is it It reminds me an awful lot of the Warlord from Dungeons & Dragons 4th Edition, it, where you are a commander of the battlefield. You use tactics and strategy, and you bark orders. Or at least you hope people listen to your orders and you give them boosts and advantages and what have you on the, on the battlefield. The big advantage of the captain, first and foremost, is every captain has their second in command, their cohort. A uh, cohort can be a humanoid of various uh, options, everything from a warrior to a wizard, like a, a magician. There's even an option to... Uh, 
to make your cohort undead if you want to go that sort of macabre uh, direction for your character concept. So you get a cohort, which in a, in a set of, or follower, that it functions in a very similar ma manner to that of an animal companion. Uh, except, uh, of course, you have to, with an animal companion, their loyalty is almost 100% a certain. Uh, with a humanoid thinking, free-willed cohort, it's a little, it's a more of a give and take relationship, I suppose. Although I suppose the same thing could be argued with the animal companion. The cohort levels up with you, although it's by by no means as powerful as a as a player character. It's it's in a very similar vein to uh, the sidekicks that were found in Tasha's uh, Cauldron of Everything. If you if anyone's had the opportunity to take a look at it, although they have their own interesting tricks attached to them. As for the captain themselves, as I said, it's a martial class. They they're almost like a a battle master light is is a good way of uh, describing them. They have a D8 hit die instead of a uh, D10 like uh, fighters. Additionally, while well, they have weapon a fighting style and all sorts of other tricks, they don't have as many ability score improvements. What they do have, have however, is they get battle dice, which um, are very similar to uh, mastery or, or superiority dice that the battle master had, uh, for, which, which is the fighter subclass. Additionally, they have what are called, what are called war tactics and banners. So their battle dice uh, can be added to die roll, certain die rolls based off of what tactics the captain is uh, familiar with. Most of the tactics, however, are um, they're things that would like you would bark in order to allow another character to make an additional attack. And then they would get to add one of your battle dice to that action. Those are the very very similar to that of a a battle master, or certain uh, techniques or maneuver combat maneuvers of the battle master, but they have their own interesting spin on it for uh, the captain. The captain's bag of tricks when it comes to these tactics, they're all pretty much the same, until you pick which banner uh, you have for your for your uh, captain. The ca the banners are these are, this is the sort of tried and true strategic uh, strategical method that your uh, your captain adheres to, or your character adheres to. Uh, there are seven to choose from. Dragon, eagle, jolly roger, lion, ram, raven and turtle. Dragon is the super aggressive one where it's all about like offense like just brutally striking at your opponent eagle is an archery based one jolly roger is all sorts of cutthroat uh pirate or ship side tactics which works really really well in space combat as well uh lion is all about like honorable duels and and the like that would normally be associated with uh, knights and duelists. Ram is brute force. Um, not in the same vein as the uh, dragon. The dragon is all about like damage. The ram is all about striking hard, like like knocking down walls, knocking down doors, dro knocking your opponent down to the ground. There's a lot of things that force your opponent to go prone on the uh in the the ram uh, tactics the raven is all about guerrilla warfare and the turtle is all about defensive strategies each one of them when you pick your banner it's like your subclass and as you progress in levels you it unlocks certain tactics exclusively for that particular sort of um that military set of military tactics now the 
captain clearly is aimed towards a more like a military officer or something similar but at the same time you could easily adopt it to you could be a space pirate captain uh you could easily be a member of like a like i don't know like an el elven uh, guerrilla warfare like wood elves defending their homeland sort of deal uh eagle could also be used for just a company a uh, mercenary company of archers or it doesn't even need to be that it could you be a you could be robin hood effectively if, if you, and his his band of merry men could easily fall under the eagle banner of tactics there's a whole plethora of different options for character concepts uh but primarily it seems to be aimed towards playing a character who with some sort of military um background of some sort or another the, i don't know if they if they have any sort of healing tactics in them i haven't really plumbed into into the depths of what the tactics can and cannot do beyond just a, a, a brief uh, summary look over. And as I said before, they remind me an awful lot of the maneuvers of a battle master, except pretty much every tactic at your disposal is meant to empower your cohort or other party members. So the captain is, like I said, an excellent, like, they, they can be an integral part of a party. Uh, they work really well if not necessarily they can fight on the front lines alongside the fighter, but where they especially excel is w when you have a large group of characters or a large party of characters and you, you can take control of the uh, like turn resolution because you can give commands during the course of your turn to other players that may have may have already acted in their entirety or have yet to act which allow, allows you to allows them to act outside of their regular turn order which is super handy since uh, uh so long as you get the initiative drop on everybody else which makes me inclined to think this would be a really good class to have a have either a high dexterity for or maybe take a feat that would uh, improve your initiative considerably anyways enough of that sort of rambling about the captain been doing that for about 12 minutes now uh let's just go briefly into i guess construct graphs i'll probably this will probably be a two-parter uh since i want to keep this to under 20 minutes today so in Dark, in the Dark Matter setting, uh, as well as the setting uh, Misfits of the Galaxy, there's a, a species called the Vec. The Vec are um, effectively the Warforged. So I'll, I might go into the history of the species a bit further beyond that. But just like the War, later, but just like the Warforged, um, the idea behind them is they're construct they're a living construct race and they're capable of uh sw like switching and replacing limbs and the like rather easily uh in order to accommodate uh whatever task they're trying to perform so a uh, vec going into combat is very likely to be armed with like an arm blade but when they're done combat, they might, and if they're going about conducting repairs afterwards and that, they might easily take that, take that arm blade off, a, and like that entire limb off, and install one with like maybe some sort of omni tool at the end of it or something similar to that effect. Uh, so the, this makes them extremely versatile, but it, at the same time, it, a lot of their um, graph technology can be applied to organic species, although in that case it's a little bit more invasive. So I'm just going to go over like vaguely how it's done today, and then maybe in another episode I'll go into monster graphs as well as like uh, 
like what sort of graphs are actually available. So attaching a graft is a very complex and laborious uh, surgical procedure, obviously. It takes at least an hour. So like uh, during a short rest, in theory, you can perform the surgery on somebody. It requires a heat. It requires healer's kit, it requires a mechanical tools, and some sort of knife. And this is if you're doing it out in the field, but it's strongly recommended that if you're going to perform this, you want to be in a sterile facility. That's to perform the operation on somebody. Um, after the surgery is performed, there's a recovery time. Uh, even with magical healing, you lose half your hit points <clears throat> when uh, when a graft is Im implanted, and all your hit dice for like that you would normally use for short rest recovery are spent immediately. Uh, for the next 24 hours, uh, you can't use the actual graft itself. It's unless it's necessary for your survival. For example, let's say you replace somebody's heart or lungs or something similar. Aside from its basic functionality, it's not it's it's non-functional, as it takes time for the the body to process and adjust to having it. Even then, there's a chance of rejection. Uh, you can replace it on an organic being. You can replace a graft with a different graft. Uh, relatively easier as the initial implantation process has already been done on the first one like any sort of fixtures and that and bolting bolts and that that were required to be installed with the first craft will simply be reused to affix the second one it still nonetheless takes the um, takes that the, the rec same recovery time and the like. That's for attaching it to your regular uh, Tom, Dick, or Nancy, or whatever term you want to use for that particularly. For a living, breed, like a human, an elf, a dwarf, anyone who's 100% organic. For the Vec, or for Warforged from more primitive worlds, um, it's actually a lot easier. They can basically take one off and put, they can take the limb off or the like and reattach a new one in about 10 minutes. Uh, additionally, they, it doesn't exhaust their, um, it doesn't cost them the hit points and it doesn't cost them the uh, hit die. And it's fully functional shortly there, shortly after being installed. This is because, of course, being a living construct, uh, their bodies are able to adapt to having a construct graft attached to or affixed to it a lot quicker. This, of course, in fact, the Vec and the Warforge themselves can install said grafts by themselves, provided it is not something that's being installed in the head or the arms, because uh, in in both those, ins with the arms, it's kind of hard to install a graft on the limb that you're trying to use to, like, unless you have far more joints than I have in my limbs, you're not performing surgery on your own arms. Additionally, with the head, same sort of problem as... Uh, since most of their sensory organs are built into their uh, into the head of their frames, performing any sort of graft surgery on that requires an, an external, um, I guess, medic slash technician, right? So that's how cy grafts, which are the construct grafts, which are effectively cybernetics, are are installed effectively. When it comes to the monster graphs, they function on a very similar level when it comes to being attached. Same sort of... Ser the rules are almost identical. The big difference between them is that uh, the, there are no species that are innately uh, adapted to the use of monstrous graphs. 
uh, monstrous graphs are often from worlds with, that are less magically refined and have less magitech, obviously, but nonetheless have a uh, have alchemists and uh, transmuters and other arcanists who are willing to push the envelope of what should be considered to be acceptable magical modifications on on uh, living beings. So as I said, they, it has a very similar sort of requirement. Uh, it requires alchemist supplies rather than the uh, the mechanic mechanist tools that the uh, construct craft requires. I'll probably put together some sort of um, cheat sheet for my players, and I'm, in fact, I might actually post it up as a PDF with the next episode for people to peruse. At least a link to. Uh, it might be more helpful. Additionally, I'll go through the, the entire list of uh, what graphs are readily available of, of both types. Anyways, um, I think I've rambled an, along for enough of your time. It's a bit over 20 minutes at this point. Um, next week, I'll go through the list of graphs, both monstrous and construct based. Unless uh, somebody gives me some so, some sort of ideas to what content they would like to see coming up next, but until then, I'd like to say to everybody, uh, I hope that all your D20s roll a critical. And until next time, take care.